Welcome to Korea and the World, a podcast on political, economic, and social issues from the perspective of the Korean Peninsula. Introduced to Korea during the first millennia, Buddhism has a long history on the peninsula and remains until today a major influence on the Korean society. This is nothing, however, compared to the clout it enjoyed as state religion during the Korea period from the 10th until the end of the 14th century. What caused the downfall of Buddhism in Korea? A popular argument is that Buddhism had become so powerful and corrupt that the state had to suppress it. Professor Jun An opposes this Confucian critique and we had the pleasure of interviewing him on the matter. After an overview of the current narrative, he told us about the societal shifts in the late Korea dynasty, the problematic integration of newcomers into the Korean elite and how these factors led to the fall of Buddhism's popularity. Professor Jun An is Assistant Professor of Buddhist and Korean Studies at the University of Michigan. In addition to various articles on East Asian Buddhism, he has also a forthcoming book on the subject, Buddhas and Ancestors, Religion and Wealth in 14th Century Korea. Professor An received his PhD in Buddhist Studies from the University of California, Berkeley. Professor Jun An, welcome to Korea and the World. Well, thank you for uh, inviting me to this interview. I'm honored. You do research on and teach about Buddhism, and especially Buddhist practices in East Asia several hundred years ago. What got you interested in this topic? Oh, that's a very good question. I guess this is a bit of a personal answer, but long, long time ago, I actually once lived as a Buddhist monk in Korea. And so I guess my interests stem from there. I've always had an interest in Korean Buddhism, and I've never actually had the opportunity to study it academically until quite recently. But serendipitously, I encountered something that really piqued my interest, and I decided to just develop it into a full-blown research project. We would like to discuss the downfall of Buddhism in pre-modern Korea, and specifically during the Goryeo dynasty. Before going any further, could you briefly sum up what role Buddhism played in Korea during that era? Sure. This may be taking us a little far afield from our comfort zone, Korea, but to really understand how the unique characteristics of Korea Buddhism developed, I think it's worth considering what Buddhism looked like in China at the time. And in fact, the kinds of Buddhisms that made its way into Korea came from various routes. So there was a northern route, there was also the sea route, which imported mainly the Buddhism of the southern Chinese region. And these Buddhisms that developed in these different regions in China really had different characteristics. The one that seems to, at least as far as I can tell, seems to have had the most impact was the Buddhism that started to develop in southern China. And this includes everything from doctrinal treatises and the kinds of scholastic communities that developed around them to popular practices, not only among the elites, but also the common folk, and also the way that the monasteries organized even. Now, none of this stuff is really studied uh, very well, partly because in Korea we don't really have the material that we would need to reconstruct this. So if we consider um, what Buddhism looked like down in the south, let's say in the 10th century, when China was in a bit of chaos before the founding of the Song Dynasty, there was a very intimate relationship between local warlord types who eventually declared themselves kings and emperors and the Buddhist church. And if you look at what's going on at the early period of Koryo, you see something very similar happening. I don't think that's a coincidence. And so uh, in terms of the intimate relationship between Buddhism or the Buddhist establishment and government or state, I think it's a natural extension of the things to which the Koryo Buddhists were being exposed to at the time. And the fact that maritime trade was a frequent mode of exchange between Koryo and its continental neighbor, I think further strengthens strengthens at least my belief that the kinds of Buddhism that I'm familiar with in China is the kind of Buddhism that we're seeing in Koryo. So it's under these circumstances that Koryo Buddhism starts to develop into a very powerful and affluent institution in, in Korea. 
And it's in part due to the fact that the royal family is one of its most important patrons. But the reason why the Buddhist establishment was able to really establish itself in the capital and become such an important part of society is because it found ways to speak to the elites, but it also found ways to speak to, again, the common folk. And so there's no easy way to describe Puri Buddhism, but one way I would describe it is it was definitely a a state-sponsored and state-supporting religion, but it also had characteristics that the state clearly didn't control, and that's another reason why it was so successful. Were the overwhelming majority of people living on the Korean Peninsula at the time therefore practicing Buddhist? Well, um, I think that's the assumption. We don't know. I don't think we can actually do a headcount of the Buddhists at the time, if it made any sense to refer to some anybody as a Buddhist. But as far as we can tell, among the social elites, Buddhism seems to have been the most obvious ways in which to address certain life cycle issues. So death would be the most obvious one. If you look at the material remains of the elites, of which we have so much more than the common folk, um, it's very clear that Buddhism had a big role to play in essentially the way that the elites prepared for death. For the common folk, it's not clear. It's uh, one of the few things that we do know is that certain forms of what we call popular faith were also popular among the common folk in Korea as well. And for the royal family, I think it was only expected that the royal family get to enjoy the kinds of privileges, which also included Buddhist rights and Buddhist uh, advice, um, that the Chinese sovereigns enjoyed. And naturally, Buddhism is found everywhere. So the quick and dirty answer to your question is, I think we can call the majority of folks during the Kodeo Buddhists, but don't quote me on that. You mentioned the elites. What were their relation with Buddhism? How did Buddhism figure in their daily life? In terms of the daily lives, we have snippets of tantalizing information about the things that the elites did with Buddhism. And they're not the kinds of things that excite scholars. They're exactly the kind of things that you would expect a good Buddhist to do. They would make monthly, yearly, or some people who are rich enough, daily donations to the Sangha holding vegetarian feasts for Buddhist monks for a variety of different purposes, to pray for long life, to pray for good health, and also to prepare for death. In addition, you also see instances where women, high stature, high social stature, would go on pilgrimages. And this seems to have been a very common leisure activity. Very few people could probably afford to do this, but they seem to have been very important patrons of Buddhist monasteries. And what we also have are big steely inscriptions, uh, one of the few things that survive and therefore the more important sources that we, we rely on to reconstruct Kota society and history. And there, on one side, you have the narrative, and it's very helpful, but usually on the other side, Uh, which sometimes escapes people's attention, you have just lists and lists of names. And those are actually quite important because if you can sometimes identify the folks written on the back of these dailies, you can see that the majority of them form political cliques and they mostly come from uh, the capital elites. And out in the countryside, of course, you had local elites participating in these activities as well. But when we're talking about the incredibly large monasteries near the capital, and if you look at the primary patrons, it's clear that the most affluent and also the most politically influential figures were the most important patrons. And that seems to imply that Buddhism didn't just serve a personal spiritual role, but also a political one in that um, it was also an opportunity for some folks to get together and uh, do something that didn't necessarily look political but clearly had political um, implications. In practice, does this mean that the monks themselves became political actors, that the state was in some way under the influence of Buddhism, and that one can imagine the Koryo dynasty similar to the European kingdoms of that era, which were heavily influenced by the church? (laughs) 
I think the Buddhist establishment's relationship to the state doesn't really compare to the Christian church's incredible influence over various European polities in the medieval period. But admittedly, there are some similarities because the relationship was so intimate. To use one example, and, and I think some other very enlightened professors who've also done this uh, podcast with you probably can answer this much better than I, but one king who's often misunderstood is King Injong. And he had a lot of family drama, and he's also been embroiled in a lot of difficulties politically. But one of the things that really didn't get enough attention is the fact that he was a very important patron of the Buddhist church. In fact, if you look at his reign in the dynastic history, uh, most of the time he's visiting Buddhist monasteries and also Taoist guans, I suppose, to perform a cho in the Taoist context or a Buddhist vegetarian feast at a Buddhist monastery. And the alarming frequency with which he did this, I think, was often misinterpreted as him just being a blindly pious, I suppose, king. In instances like Myocheng, for example, very famous, right? Professor Broker's research has really done wonders in dispelling some mistaken notions about this figure. But one thing is clear, I think, monks like Myocheng shouldn't be understood as religious figures who had too much influence on politics. But if you actually understand the entire thing in context, what becomes clear is that there were a lot of weather-related anomalies during this period. And these heavenly calamities were always considered to be the responsibility of the sovereign. And so regardless of what the king's personal belief or his state of piety was, it was just simply his obligation and his right and also duty to make sure that he, well, subdues these calamities or puts an end to them. And it was understood that the most efficient technology in achieving this goal were these sacrifices and also these vegetarian feasts. So that's what he did. The frequency with which I think the middle period Kodo kings visited religious institutions and participated in religious activities it should be understood essentially as an extension of their roles as sovereigns of the domain. Now, does that mean that Buddhism played an extraordinarily influential role in the development and the maintenance of the Kodo state? To a certain extent, yes. For people monasteries, for example, aid and remedy monasteries, these were considered to be a natural extension of the state, and that's why they were allowed to receive state support, and nobody doubted that they were supposed to receive state support. But I don't know if that then should be understood as evidence of religion's extensive influence in politics. I think that would be reading too much into the evidence. The Goryeo dynasty had a fairly close relation with Buddhism, as we discussed. Is this unique to Goryeo Korea? whether other periods in Korean history or throughout world history? Yes. So I think, again, if you look at Korea's continental neighbor, that's where the model is coming from. So the sovereign was always subject to interpretation in, in terms of what the sovereign is supposed to be doing. And I think that was a very important part of politics, at least in China and Korea. And the Tang Dynasty established a very important model, and a lot of people look to the Tang. During the Tang, powerful monarchs often took advantage of essentially the technologies and the knowledge that the Buddhist establishment had to offer. And so in Korea, they naturally understood this to be a privilege that monarchs should be able to enjoy in Korea as well. In other contexts in China, you see other similar developments taking place as well in earlier periods, but again, during the Five Dynasties period, just before the founding of the Song, you see, again, a lot of local warlords slash rulers starting to establish a certain image of themselves. 
as benign rulers and again buddhism played a very important role in that regard and so i think these all played a role in essentially solidifying this image of buddhism and state having a very close relationship not only in china but in korea as well so there are i think other examples and japan is another good example but i think that's taking the conversation too far from the topic your publisher described your work as a revisionist history. Could you describe what is the main narrative that you're actually opposing? There are a few. And as anyone who's attempted a revisionist history, I think, can say without any difficulty, it's not always the best way to do justice to earlier works that really have played a very important role in shaping the field. And so all due credit should be given to the scholarship that made the study of Kodi Buddhism possible. But the way my work tries to revisit and, I guess, re-envision Kodi history, it's really just taking issues with just a few aspects of earlier scholarship. So just to specify two, one is, and I think the thesis will probably sound very familiar to folks interested in Korean history, there was this idea that Korea Joseon transition was in large part the product of an ideological transformation of essentially the Korea elites. And this thesis has been actually revisited by many scholars. And uh, though it still remains very influential for very good reason, I think there are a lot of good reasons have been presented to kind of nuance the picture a bit further. The other argument that I've tried to revisit in my work is a very popular one in Korea. Sometimes the argument is just simply presented where, in fact, it can be clearly traced to a few scholars. Uh, and the argument is that Buddhism grew decadent, too affluent, and therefore reform-minded scholars in the late Korea period decided to essentially criticize Buddhism for its decadence. And among some very radically minded elite reformists, they decided that it was now time to essentially abandon Buddhism altogether. So the two arguments that really form the backdrop against which I've been trying to establish my own work is the Shinung Sadebu argument, as it's usually known, or the New Scholar Officials, and also the decadence of Koryo Buddhism argument. So those are the two major ones, hence the, I think, revisionist history label. Could you give us some examples in practice of this decadence? Well, okay, so then I guess I'll have to go straight into what I do with this material. So the argument that I make is that we actually can't just simply label something decadent and corrupt without a better sense of what we mean by those terms. So was Buddhism pure at one point, but then it was corrupted by material influences and material affluence? There's just no evidence for this whatsoever if you actually look at Buddhist institutions and the Buddhist institutions that interested not only us, but also uh, the Koryo elite themselves. Um, these institutions have always enjoyed an incredible material existence. They were incredibly well endowed uh, in terms of land and human resources. And because Buddhism was one of the earliest corporations, right, where assets became easy to accumulate and they were inalienable, they belong not to a particular human being, but to essentially an incorporated entity, they just continue to grow in size economically. And so I don't know if we can use that growth of which we have actually very little evidence. We're just assuming that they continue to grow as evidence of decadence. If you look at the Buddhist institutions as just institutions that provided a banking function sort of to the state and also to local society, Buddhist monasteries often stored grains, 
and they use them as movable capital, as loans, uh, to put it in another way, and charged interest, and they continue to make money that way. Uh, some find, find this to be a little disturbing that Buddhists are engaged in such crude economic activities, but this is something that's been part of the Buddhist church since as long as we can remember in East Asia. And so when these things are taken into account, it's at least to me, it's not clear that we can simply label what's going on in Buddhist monasteries in Koryo as corrupt and decadent. They're just doing what they've always been doing. This critique has at times been described as a Confucian critique. Why is that? It's a good question. It's been considered a Confucian critique because the criticism voiced by a handful of people, very noteworthy historical people, have essentially been used as the fulcrum on which these arguments have been hoisted up and established. So, um, again, a good example is Cheng Dojun. His critique of Buddhism has kind of come to stand for essentially the view of the entire elite. And Cheng Dojun himself clearly stands on a certain ideological ground to launch this critique. And that ideological ground is what most of us refer to as Confucianism or Neo-Confucianism. The name isn't so important, but what is important is our willingness to, again, see Cheng Dojun as not the rule, but sort of as the exception. So similar critiques ha- can be found in the writings of other eminent Korea period scholars or scholar officials. Choi He's work is often cited as uh, an example of this. Sometimes you'll occasionally find very penetrating and insightful pseudo-critiques of Buddhism in the writings of Lee Jae-hyun and Lee Sek, for example. But if you, again, put Cheng Dojun on this big, long spectrum of, essentially, the Korea elite's critical engagement with Buddhism, what's clear is that Neo-Confucianism or Confucianism can't be necessarily considered to be the primary motivating force behind the critical voices that were appearing in greater frequency in the late Korea period. What I've tried to show in my work is that, in fact, a closer look at the early 14th century and somewhat the late 13th century, what you see is that folks are concerned of not necessarily about advancing a Confucian or Neo-Confucian understanding of Buddhism, not so much that as this effort to come to terms with who they are as as elites. And that really was what piqued my interest. Why were these people revisiting the issue of who they were? Why were they trying to very subtly reinvent themselves, not as hereditary elites or sejok as we sometimes call them, but as sajok, members of an official class, or officials class. But here, sa means more than officials. It really represents a certain uh, leaning where we're really talking about officials who are concerned about and interested in promoting bureaucratic official ideals, the ideals of a central bureaucratic official. And as this transformation starts to take place, what you see, at least in my opinion, is a growing interest in essentially redefining one's relationship with Buddhism. Some folks took a more critical stance than others, but I think these different shades of gray we need to take into account rather than just simply giving the blanket label neo-confusion critics of of Buddhism. So why did the elites actually start trying to redefine themselves? What happened? Well, the Mongols happened. Although I have been told that blaming everything on the Mongols is not a very good idea. But 
By the Mongols, I really mean broad shifts that really started to take place all throughout the late 13th and the early half of the 14th century. What we see is a fundamental restructuring of Koryo politics and Koryo society. And some of these changes were carried out systematically, others voluntarily and in a more surreptitious way. But uh, overall, I think the picture is there's a lot changing during this period. And I think more work needs to be done, not just on, uh, and I blame myself for this as well, work needs to be done on the social aspect of change and, and whatnot during this period. I think there's been way too much, I think, interest in just the political dimension of change under Mongol rule. So why did the elites started to revisit the issue of who they are during this period? I think the situation was far more complex than we can ever imagine, but at least, you know, t to make an educated guess on the basis of surviving evidence, what seems to have happened is members of the elite and and some new recruits and by new recruits i mean people who in earlier periods would have never had the opportunity to make it into the elite stratum we're really talking about slaves commoners merchants translators or interpreters and butchers even they slowly started to make their way into the elite stratum during the age of military rule but not to the extent that we see their entry in the mongol period we're really talking about large numbers of uh, new recruits really making their way into the elite stratum during this period now I think one common way of understanding the political and social strife during this period among the elites is that there are the old elites, these are the old hereditary families, and then there were the new recruits, meaning these folks from very questionable backgrounds, I suppose, or unconventional backgrounds. But one of the things that really became clear to me is there entry did cause a lot of uproar the new recruits into the elite stratum and the old elites did actually voice their serious concerns about their entry into the elite stratum but that period is of interest to me and to my work but for me the real questions especially with regards to buddhism and elite identity only really start to emerge uh, in a serious way when these new recruits essentially start to find ways to legitimately establish their identities as members of the elite. This is when it becomes very difficult because let's say you had a slave eunuch who becomes a very powerful minister and this actually happened quite frequently during this period. Some of these slave eunuchs really, they never seem to have really made the effort to blend in I guess that would be one way of putting it. And in those cases, you do see just harsh criticism of their actions and complaints about their extensive role in politics and whatnot. And what this clearly implies is that there was an understanding that there was a big difference between the traditional elites and these new recruits. But there are other cases, and one figure in particular has played a very important role in shaping my thesis, and that is a man named Cho Yingyu, and also his sons. He was a Mongolian interpreter, and he accompanied the crown prince to the Yuan capital. And there, uh, using his Mongolian skills, he seems to have played a very important role in essentially getting things that the Korean sovereigns needed which also included a Mongolian bride, a member of the imperial clan. And so through these actions, these men of very humble origins, like Cho Yingyu, very quickly rose up the social ladder and they will hold, at one time, unthinkable positions like chancellor. Now, what's interesting about Cho Yingyu and his family, and he's really not an exception, there are a lot of other people who followed suit, they always wanted to fit in. And I think you can kind of see their humanity in these efforts. Instead of simply relying on their ties to the Mongols, 
to elevate their position and maintain their status. What's clear is that they look to essentially their fellow elites and the traditional, I guess, elites, and they studied what makes the elites the elites. And they arrived at the right conclusion. It really was social customs that allowed the elites to perpetuate themselves as the elites. And so men like Chu ying and his family, they start to essentially rely on the social conventions, uh, or I guess we can call them religious conventions, and privileges that the traditional elites had always enjoyed. So they started building memorial uh, monasteries, and they had big portrait halls where they hung their funerary portraits. They funded Buddhist rituals to make sure that their ancestors were well taken care of in this institutional context. And these were very important practices for establishing and also maintaining elite identity. And Chu ying and his family took that to their advantage, so they actually took advantage of it. Other people did the same thing. And this is when the complications start to arise because another important aspect of this practice is you need to secure stele inscriptions for your memorial monastery, for example, or anything that is worthy of essentially recording. So they asked renowned scholar officials like Yi Jae-hyun or Yi Sek, even Chuehe, these people who sometimes are associated with criticism of Buddhism during this period, to write stele inscriptions on their behalf and their family's behalf. And here in these inscriptions, you see things that you wouldn't really expect to see in earlier periods. So they are more than happy, the writers are more than happy to praise these families for essentially behaving like the elite, and doing elite things, doing them in a proper way. But these writers also made sure to add a few caveats. And those caveats, they're subtle, but I think those caveats really uh, give it away. They made sure to note that what Cho ying and his family, for instance, is doing is important precisely because there are all these people who are doing it the wrong way where they just clearly pursue wealth for the sake of pursuing wealth, where they clearly pursue power for the sake of just pursuing power. But Cho ying and his family are different because they don't. They, in fact, aspire to higher goals, which is what all elite families are supposed to do. Now, that, of course, if you take it literally, sounds just like a you know, blanket praise for essentially a fellow member of the elite. But in fact, there is a subtle hint of criticism embedded in that statement. And those are the things that really caught my attention because the way they worded it implied that the elite started to understand a fundamental difference between essentially the material form of donating to a Buddhist church and essentially the moral substance behind it. And they were starting to claim that, in fact, these new recruits, the folks from non-traditional backgrounds, they only know the material form, but they can't be considered elites because they don't partake in the moral substance of giving. And of course, these writers are saying that there are a few exceptions, like Cho ying and his family. They, of course, can, because of their incredible wealth, partake in the material aspect of giving, but that they also understand the moral substance as well. But once this discourse was introduced, then there was really no turning back because it made it possible at the grammatical, I suppose, or conceptual level to distinguish between essentially wealth and for the sake of convenience, what I'll call just religion. So what I claim in my work is that the separation of religion and wealth happens as a product of this. And only after the separation of wealth in such a way was it possible to really start to claim that the Buddhist church was decadent, was corrupt, and so on. Without this conceptual separation between religion and wealth, in my opinion, I 
it just really makes no sense to talk about corruption or decadence or any of that because giving to the Buddhist monastery and the Buddhist monastery being affluent was never really considered a problem. That was just what the Buddhist church was. On this subject, you wrote that these non-traditional elements in the central bureaucracy, and I quote, introduced a new twist to this understanding of Buddhist temples. Greatness could no longer be simply taken as a given fact, but as something that had to be established, maintained, and demonstrated. Could you tell us more about this? Yes. So it's um, not unrelated to what I just said, my answer to the previous question. But the idea is that, and again, there's a subtle hint of criticism actually embedded in, in statements made in relation to that statement about greatness. So... Put simply, what's going on is you have influential scholar officials like Yi Jae-hyun writing in inscriptions for monasteries something along the lines of, well, let's look at this monastery. It's a great monastery. This person uh, just donated a whole lot of wealth to essentially restore this monastery, right? And uh, restoring monasteries is always a great thing because it's not only serving the individual who made the donation, but it's also serving the state and also working for the benefit of the people and so on. Now, what Lee Jae-hyun and others are trying to really say here is there are people who just go and do rampant building projects to essentially satisfy their own egos and... He's saying that there are people who go through the painstaking process of restoring monasteries to back to their glory days. And instead of relying on state support, which was de rigueur actually during this period, he's saying these people need to be praised because they're willing to essentially do things that the nouveau riche, for lack of a better word, we're happy to do, which is to just flaunt their wealth by just building new things. And the argument, the argument about why it's important to essentially maintain and restore monasteries became a very convenient way and metaphor for talking about families and what makes an elite family an elite family. And again, it's there's a subtle hint of criticism embedded in this, but what folks like EJ are trying to say is, Look, the nouveau riche, the new recruits, the men from non-traditional backgrounds, they just don't have this concept of having a family maintain and struggle to maintain its reputation over many generations. They just appeared overnight. And so what E and others are trying to then say is real elites are the elites who know how to follow and espouse the old values of the traditional elites, right? And that's something that these new elites lack. In your writings, a key moment in the downfall of Buddhism is the late Korea fiscal crisis. What does a fiscal crisis have to do with Buddhism? It's a very good question. Um, that it was the question that I've been actually struggling with for I think the longest time and that's because for me I I looked at what other folks had to say about the matter and there seems to have been a consensus that in fact if we rule out the ideological argument that in fact the new scholar officials were motivated by their neo-confucian ideals to essentially subject buddhism to oppression and criticism and then we turn to an alternative argument presented by people like Yi Sangbaek, for example, that the criticism of Buddhism was in fact rooted in fiscal concerns because the Buddhist church was so wealthy, uh, so extensively involved in various aspects of economic activities in Korea that the state had to intervene and try to solve their own fiscal crisis by essentially confiscating the wealth of the Buddhist church. There is some truth to this. I just thought the argument was a little too simple, especially because if we look at, again, the evidence from this period, the late Korea and the early Joseon, what I think becomes very clear is that, in fact, the early Joseon state, like the previous dynasty, 
still understood the important cultural and social value of Buddhism and the Buddhist establishment. And so they wanted to, like at the very beginning of the Kota dynasty, uh, maintain some semblance of control over the Buddhist establishment. But I don't think there really was a will or a desire to completely get rid of it or suppress it. And so the bigger concern, I think, was after the devastation wreaked by initially the Mongols and then the Red Turbans and the Japanese pirates, one of the responsibilities that the state, a burden that they had to bear, was the restoration of important uh, state symbols like people monasteries, for example. But the state was broke, so... The, I think the solution that they found was that if they take away a little bit or maybe a lot from incredibly rich monasteries and reshuffle that and gave some of that to essentially monasteries that were in need, then they could play a zero-sum game, that the state wouldn't have to dish out anything from its own reserves to essentially do what any good new state was expected to do, which was to restore important symbols and establish its presence uh, in the capital and also in the countryside. Buddhist monasteries were very important in that regard. Uh, The other aspect of the fiscal crisis that's of some importance in understanding Buddhism is I think the downfall or the decline of Buddhism is really the wrong way to understand it. And this is, I think, the one thing that I've been arguing the longest, there really isn't good evidence to actually make that claim. What I think we need to present a slightly more nuanced claim, uh, which I tried to do. I don't know if I actually succeeded in doing it, but what I tried to show in my work is that, in fact, what's happened to Buddhism is not that it actually declined or that it shrunk, but that there was an attempt to remove it from Uh, the realm of public authority into the margins of public authority. Let me just try to explain that a little bit. So there was an understanding that Buddhist monasteries were still very important symbols that could represent the presence of the state in the capital and the countryside. But there was also a concern, a lesson that essentially the officials class learned during the Mongol period of how much of common wealth could essentially be privatized. And so extensive levels of the privatization of wealth was undertaken with the assistance of the Buddhist establishment. Again, from the perspective of an early Kodo Buddhist, there was nothing really wrong with that inherently. But again, it's the extent to which it occurred and also the fiscal crisis that the late quarter and the early chosen state had to bear that essentially fueled this idea that the safest thing that the new chosen state could do is to try to prevent further privatization of wealth. And so their solution was if we make it impossible for the level of economic activities that we're calling privatization to occur, then we could find at least one meaningful solution to the fiscal crisis that we're experiencing right now. And so that meant that the levels of support that the Buddhist church received from the state was not going to reach the levels that you know the Buddhist church had or the Buddhist establishment had once enjoyed during the Koryo period. And that's why I say that Buddhism was pushed into the margins of public authority. The officials really wanted to systematically not oppress Buddhism, but redefine Buddhism's role not as a natural extension of the state, but as something else, something that didn't necessarily require state support. And I think the shift in the relationship uh, fundamentally altered what the Buddhist establishment was, at least at the public level. And it started to essentially begin its march towards becoming what we just, I think, in colloquial terms refer to as religion, which is a private affair, I think, um, today. But clearly it wasn't during the Kodo period, but I think this process is what made that transition possible.
To conclude, almost three years ago, Professor Sam Vermeesh of Seoul National University told us that, for the most part, Buddhism didn't play an active political role in South Korea. From today's perspective, should we therefore see the role of Buddhism during the Koryo dynasty as exceptional and the high point of Buddhism in Korea? I guess in a word we can say, sure, why not? Uh, We can call it the high point. If we want to define the high point in terms of an active engagement and interest in Buddhism at all levels, that's exactly what we see during the Koryo period, at least um, for most of the Koryo period. And I see no reason why we can't actually consider that to be a high point of Buddhism, considering how, how much less interest and involvement is headed towards Buddhism's direction today in contemporary Korea. So, yeah, Koryo Buddhism is truly unique within Korean history in that regard. But again, if you draw a larger picture and you see what happened to Buddhism in neighboring states like Japan or China, then what you realize is that Koryo Buddhism shouldn't necessarily be regarded as unique or exceptional, but there are unique characteristics to it. The growth and decline and the strong and weak characteristics of Koryo Buddhism and earlier Shilla Buddhism and later Chosun Buddhism bear a small but important resemblance to the larger shifts that are taking place in the Buddhist establishment in China and Japan as well. They all walk their own independent paths, but there clearly was a point where the lingua franca of monarchs and sovereigns was Buddhism. They walked and talked in Buddhism, and that was considered the norm. But when we start to enter what I think some historians call the early modern period, Buddhism is clearly no longer regarded as a lingua franca, especially for rulers and the elites, and alternative competing systems start to really play a more important role and Korea was no exception in this regard. So what happened to Buddhism in Joseon may not have been necessarily identical in terms of how it developed in China or Japan, but in terms of the broader picture, I don't think that what happened to Buddhism in the Joseon period is all that shocking, considering the larger shifts that were taking place in the way folks in East Asia were reconceiving history and politics and society and whatnot. And I think changes, uh, fundamental changes to the relationship with Buddhism was, well, inevitable. And I think the contemporary period, of course, is no exception in this regard. Professor An, thank you so much for your time. Thank you for inviting me to this podcast. This was Korea and the World. To make sure you don't miss our next episode, bookmark our website, koreaandtheworld.org, subscribe to our podcast on iTunes, and follow us on Facebook and Twitter.